Thanks, Lauren. For most of the circularity audience, I don't think Lisa Jackson needs much of an introduction, but I'll give a short one. Since 2013, Lisa has had Apple's environmental and social initiatives, and more, more recently has been vice president for environment policy and social initiatives at Apple. Uh, before that, she was the administrator of the US Environmental Protection Agency during Barack Obama's first term. But beyond those biographical details is the leadership and vision that Lisa has brought to Apple and in the social and environmental initiatives, including circular economy ones. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, so first of all, Lisa, it's great to see you again. Welcome to Circularity. Joel, so nice to be back. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about Apple's uh, make but don't take. I think that's the word make but not take initiative. As an initiative, goal, aspiration, ambition, I think you have to talk a little bit about what it actually is and where you are on that. And uh, talk, so give us a little bit, uh, bring us up to date. Yeah, I love the word initiative. It's actually in my job title. And I think it is, is, it's more action oriented than a goal and certainly more than an aspiration. Those are lovely to have, but we're about doing the work here at Apple. And we certainly you know, continue to believe that the resources that our economy depends on are finite. And so it's, it's about um, the circular economy is an investment. It's an investment in opportunities for the future, for ourselves and of course, for the innovators of tomorrow. It's not and shouldn't be a financial burden. Uh, there are certainly investments we have to make, but uh, we are approaching this as a business opportunity. As you, so as you mentioned, oh, please go ahead. No, so where are you on this journey? Yeah, so we announced it several years ago and we've made tremendous progress. We didn't announce an end date because it's, it's one that's a systems goal. You know, it requires working with all of our suppliers and actually it requires uh, others in our sector to get on board so that there's markets for recycled material that are as vibrant as the markets we have today. But I can give you some great examples. You know, the uh, MacBook Air is now 40% recycled content. Of course, 100% uh, recycled aluminum in its enclosure. Our new iPhone 12, uh, the new uh, iPhone 12 Pro have 99% um, recycled tungsten and 98% recycled rare earth elements, something that we were told would be very difficult to do. Each magnet in our MagSafe accessories was sourced from post-industrial scrap. And that's in addition to the iPhone 12 magnets, which are made with recycled rare earth elements. So the innovations are happening. They're showing up in our products. That's how we know we're on the road to success. I imagine one of the challenges that you face in this is uh, getting the material, uh, finding enough uh, recycled or re reclaimed or re reusable material. And one challenge that I, I would anticipate is that uh, while you, know, you and I may find a lot of value in a, in a used or no longer needed iPhone or, or MacBook Pro or, or any of your other products, uh, but in, in most parts of the world, it's considered hazardous waste. And there are laws around uh, shipping that across borders. Uh, how does that work? And how, how are you overcoming some of those barriers? Now, a big part of our work has to be to first demonstrate that the innovations are real, that, you know, there's a reason for all these policies and regulations around the world. And that's uh, an unfortunate history by companies, you know, decades ago that did uh, use um, recycling as an excuse to transport material that wasn't there for recycling. That's why we're innovating on the technology side of recycling. You cannot recycle a used iPhone the way you would a traditional product like a you know a car or refrigerator. It actually requires some specialty thinking. So the first thing we have to do is prove through our actions that we're investing in technology innovations, like in our 17,000 square foot material recovery lab in Austin, Texas. Then we are investing in people, in uh, people whose job it is to lobby governments and talk to governments around the world to show what we're doing in terms of innovations and hopefully bring back to them this idea that if you want the circular economy, you're going to have to change rules to allow folks who are, who are doing it the right way, who have the right intentions and the right initiatives to be able to move material around the world. So it's twofold, but we know we have to have the proof points 
before we can approach governments um, because they need to build trust in, in us and in our sector. So you're saying you, you haven't approached government yet, or I'm wondering where, what the reaction oh, no, we, has we, been. Yeah, no, we absolutely have. We've been working with governments, especially in Europe uh, and especially in Asia because the movement of material, uh, you know, Europe's a great example. I think there's huge momentum and huge interest in the circular economy. There's been a lot of talk from policymakers that it's an opportunity for Europe because they are so resource constrained, but, Unfortunately, a lot of the policies there don't allow us to move material. We have a recycling robot, Daisy, that's located in the Netherlands. Being able to feed Daisy with um, end-of-life uh, products is a big challenge. And we've been working with governments there in Germany, in France, to begin to help them understand what they can do on their side to enable the circular economy that they and that their citizens want. You mentioned DAISY, you also mentioned uh, your Austin uh, Technology Center. Uh, I know that uh, DAISY begat uh, Liam and, and Liam mm -hmm. begat, I think it's Dave. Uh, I'm not sure if all <laughs> of the names are from the movie 2001, but they also <laughs> have smack of that. Uh, what's Dave able to do that, that DAISY couldn't? Yeah, so, you know, DAISY's job is disassembly of iPhone devices. And she can handle, I think, up to 17 different models of iPhone at this point. But we're, we're also learning is that once we have the phones disassembled, we need to do specialty recycling on components. So Dave's job is to recover tungsten from the Taptic engine in iPhone because we want that recycled tungsten but we need to be able to pull the component apart even further in order to get the material. Um, and so, you know, these new recycling robots are specialty vendors, if you will. They specialize in certain materials that we're interested in. And we have um, over a dozen materials that we've prioritized and said, look, these are the keys. If we can figure out how to get circularity for rare earth materials, for gold, for tungsten, um, for copper. You know, if we can figure these out, we're more than 90% of the way there on our goal towards um, truly circular products, products that are made 100% from recycled or renewable materials. So if you want to get by in the world, you have to specialize, even if you're a robot. Um, <laughs> I guess that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so circular is, is hardly the only initiative that that you've been overseeing, and and you've had uh, some pretty ambitious carbon goals that as well. How do the circular uh, goals line up, uh, in or impact the uh, carbon goals? Are they first of all aligned, or are they are there any trade offs? Oh no, they're actually very much aligned. You know, we um, we started the the with the idea that we have three goals at Apple. One of them was climate change and impacting that challenge for the better. Another was resource efficiency. But as we work those two goals, we realized what an impact one can have on the other. Um, so probably the best example I can give you is aluminum. We've spent a lot of time, we use aluminum in many of our enclosures at Apple. And so we spent time on recycled aluminum, that was really important, and also on uh, using uh, only aluminum that's smelted with hydroelectricity rather than fossil fuels because smelting is another piece of the pie. Um, because of all the work we've done on recycling, um, our carbon emissions associated with aluminum have decreased by 72% since 2015. Um, so you can see how those two, you know, basically play off against each other and in a very reinforcing way. How uh, easy or difficult is it to source green aluminum and green steel these days? Is, I mean, it's really seems like only in the past year or so that we've heard uh, much about it in the marketplace. It's been a, talked about for a long time. Is it now starting to become a sufficiently available and, and affordable that uh, a company like Apple can take advantage of it? Yeah, I mean, we knew when we started the work on the circular economy that we would have to pioneer certain materials or at least convince um, suppliers that we were a viable end market if they were to put in the extra work. That is actually a lot of the work 
that the group um, does. I think you had Sarah Chandler last year or year before last for circularity and she talked about the fact that, you know, if you really want to use recycled materials, you have to work on both ends. You have to um, find and convince recyclers, specialty recyclers to get, you know, to, to give you recycled material, but you also have to convince them that you're going to be willing, that you have people willing to buy it once they do. And so we actually work on both ends of that because we know we're we're at the point of being a catalyst. To your question, I think materials are becoming more available. I think governments can help there and are helping with um, incentives and even using their bully pulpits to say this is very important to us. Um, and we're trying to help using the power of our pocketbook and our bully pulpit with our suppliers to say this is work we want you to do alongside of us. Um, and so I think it's becoming more available. And of course, to your second question about price, as it becomes more available, as people have more, um, we, we anticipate that the price will come down. We work really hard to ensure that the materials we use are not at a huge premium, because then it, we really aren't changing the industry um, if we do that. And Tim has challenged us in everything we do to make sure it's something that can spread and, and can be scalable. Tim Cook, your CEO. Tim, um, our CEO. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit more about the bully pulpit uh, as it relates to just in this example, uh, steel or aluminum. How are you deploying that? Well, mainly in our supply chain when it comes to a specific uh, material, right? It's going out um, in the case of aluminum and working with our suppliers, our CNC operators, our um, um, enclosure um, manufacturers and suppliers to say, hey, we want recycled material. In the beginning, it was making sure that they were incredibly careful with the aluminum, you know, scraps that come off of the CNC machines, because we knew, I mean, the good thing about our aluminum is it's specced pretty tightly. And so we know that recycling that aluminum is likely to give us the same beautiful, you know, enclosure that everyone associates with our products. But now we're starting to use more and more post-consumer recycle that doesn't come from our own manufacturing. And so it's working with them so that they feel more and more comfortable that Apple's alongside you as we test and qualify and make sure that this, these new materials perform and look um, the way Apple customers expect them to look. So the bully pulpit is really about our procurement team. That work happens in our procurement operation. Um, and those relationships, of course, are longstanding and deep. And it's a matter of saying, hey, here's a journey we want to go on with you and challenging them to, uh, to use recycled materials is, is a big part of that. Another thing I want to fold into this conversation is Reggie, the racial equity and justice oh, initiative you. that you launched, I, I believe, last year, um, specifically as it relates to cir your circular economy uh, initiatives. Uh, talk a little bit about Reggie and, and how it relates to uh, circular. Thanks. Well, another acronym, but this time it's not really a name. Reggie stands for Racial Equity and Justice Initiative. And we're coming up on just about a year ago mm -hmm. when Tim announced in the wake of George Floyd's uh, killing and Breonna Taylor's killing that the country still had work to do um, around race, around equity. And using Apple, part of what we could do is be a force in the positive direction on racial equity and justice, just as we try to be on the environmental uh, initiative side. So again, racial equity and justice initiative is meant to be action oriented. And I have the honor of leading that work um, in the company along with my colleague, Alicia Johnson. Um, and so one of the things we've done, you know, my passion will always be the environment. When I was at EPA, we spent a lot of time working on environmental justice, but there's a justice that comes with removing pollution from communities, um, which is usually what we think of. But there's a, the other side of justice, which is if the clean energy economy, if the recycling economy, if the circular economy is really going to be just, it's going to lift up communities who right now don't see jobs and opportunities in clean energy or the circular economy. So we started um, uh, an impact accelerator. It was actually Alicia's uh, idea and uh, we'll soon be um, having our first class of uh, 
of accelerator businesses, but these are businesses that are black or brown owned that work on environmental, in, in the environmental sector. And the idea is to try to give those businesses a leg up, a hand in um, getting bigger, in scaling. So all the things that Apple knows about how a business grows, how it grows successfully, uh, so that it'll be here in two or three or four or five years um, is, is part of what the accelerator is about. Um, it, it's about expanding access to opportunity in a sector that we all know is going to be incredibly important over the next decades and ensuring that there's a diverse group of business women and men um, who are ready to take on the mantle of business leadership in this area. So you're a year in. Uh, what are you learning about how easy or or not easy it is to to create those opportunities? Well, you know, it, I think part of what we now know is sort of what we know we we learned about environment, which is the most important thing is to set <clears throat> your sights far onto the horizon, but also close at the same time. What do I mean by that? With environment that, you know, you and I spoke years ago when I first started at Apple, um, I'm just about at my eighth year, actually, in just a few days, I'll make eight years at Apple. And we talked about the fact that Apple doesn't like to promise to do something really far out. We prefer to announce things once they're done. Over time, we learned that actually, as we, as we had more successes in the environmental space, people need to have the, the passion and the momentum around shorter term goals. And they also need the vision of longer term goals. So you see, we have a 2030 carbon neutral for our supply chain and product uh, end use uh, energy. That's a long term goal. But we also have these wonderful times when we can challenge our product leaders and engineers to do something. Now you take that same analogy to racial equity and justice. We, of course, would like, as, as anyone in our country would, to see a day when we can say we've achieved that equity and justice. But in the interim, it's been about what we do well. And mainly that's around education. You know, this year we announced a $25 million commitment to support the Propel Center, um, a historically Black college and university initiative that will be located in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, we announced another big initiative to open our first U.S. Um, developer academy in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and we announced money for uh, Black and Latinx-focused uh, venture and bank loan funds for Black businesses. So what we're learning is that we have to keep, we have to keep at it. We have to keep our eyes on the horizon, but we also have to look longer term. I mean, shorter term, sorry, you have to keep our eyes on the horizon, but also look shorter term at things we can do right away to prove to folks that this wasn't just corporate speak, this is real action. Well, Lisa, I think that last part about balancing long-term uh, bold moonshot initiatives with the short-term realities of everyday business on the ground is uh, applicable to everything that we're talking about this morning. And uh, I, so I want to thank you for sharing that, but also for your vision and leading the way, showing the way around circularity to the green biz and circularity communities. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time today. It's always great to see you and I look forward to another catch up in the future. Oh, Thanks so my much, pleasure, Lisa. Joel. My pleasure. And thank you for your leadership on this issue and so many others. See you next time, I hope.